Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 214 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined this week by the former heavyweight world title challenger. It is, of course, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, welcome back on the show. Hey, man, thanks for having me again. You know, like I said, I, every time I come on, I appreciate, well, I appreciate you having me every time I come on. And, uh, you know, I just hope I can do a good job, as, as always. <laughs> I hope I can <laughs> No, it's brilliant having you on every time. Um, I think this is the first one that we've done since the one that we did physically together in in the in in the hotel room. So uh, brilliant, brilliant. That yeah, one, that is true. Yeah, that one was a brilliant one there. Um, but yeah, let's let's move on with things here. We're going to start with the review part of the show. We're going to start here at the Margaret Court Arena in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Um, Andrew Maloney, one of the Maloney twins, he is now 21 and 0, of course him and his twin brother both signed contracts with top rank, Um, yeah, quite impressive there, Andrew Maloney managed to get the retirement win actually after 8 rounds, Elton Darry, the opponent, now 24 and 6 with a draw, retired on his store after 8 there, it was for the interim WBA World Super Flyweight title, Uh, the doctor actually stopped the contest due to the severity of the cut um, just before the start of round nine, but I think it still counts as a retirement, apparently. So anyway, a stoppage win there. The cut was caused by a punch. Uh, Also on that undercard, of course, the other twin brother, Jason Maloney, he was able to to pick up a KO win in the second round against Dixon Flores, now 16-7 and with three draws. That one was for the WBA Oceana Bantamweight title. Jason Maloney, 20-1 and now. I think that one loss came to Emmanuel Rodriguez, of course. No shame in losing to him. Uh, moving out now to France, the Accor Hotel Arena in Paris. Over here we got to see... Um, well... We got to see Michel Soro, uh, sorry, 34 and 2 with one draw. He took on Cedric Vitu, 47 and 3. Very inflated, padded record Vitu. But anyway, he was found out. He was TKO'd in five rounds. Michel Soro, a little bit padded, but slightly more genuine his his uh, his record when you look at it now 35 and 2 with a draw on that undercard Arsene Ghoul Miriam I've never ever ever heard of this guy but anyway he's now unbelievably the new WBA super world cruiserweight champion he took on Kane Watts who's 21 and 3 um you know this guy Arsene Ghoul Miriam now 25 and 0, he's got the the KO there in the fourth round, and I've got to say, like I said, I've I've never heard of him, and um, he's the super world champion with the WBA at cruiserweight, so that's the proper top title there. So uh, I'll have to I'll have to look a little bit more at him, Eddie. But you know, a guy like that winning a world title who we haven't heard of, I'm sure you you look at things like that and think, oh, I could really dance one more time. <laughs> 100% man when you see those guys things happen you know it's a good it's a good thing to see because it does get hope for guys like myself who, who haven't been in the you know on the scene really much recently and a lot of people don't really think I got much left in the tank which I've recently been sparring and like I feel like I feel good I feel good as I've ever felt but you know it doesn't matter until you get in there and actually show absolutely and he is now 25 and 0 with 17 KOs, 32 years of age. He's Armenian, actually. And uh, he resides 
in in California, USA. Quite interesting there. It says he he resides in Big Bear, so I'm guessing he probably has some kind of dealings with Abel Sanchez. I I apologise if anyone's listening to this and they're angry because I should know who he is, but I just don't. So I'll have to do a bit of homework on him. Uh, moving out now to the Olympia in Liverpool, Merseyside, United Kingdom. A bit of a star-studded kind of card this one um, on the left side of the bill, if you like, but the right side, the opponents. Not really on the level of the home fighters, but let's start with it anyway. Rocky filled in now 28-2. and two. He was able to score a knockout in the second round against Abdallah Pazi Wapazi, <laughs> who's now 26-7 and seven with one draw. I love that surname. Um, also on the bill, Martin Murray now 39-5 and five with one draw. A points win for him over eight rounds against Sladan Janjanin, who's now 27-5. and five. Um, They're talking about Martin Murray against Liam Williams. I think Liam Williams is all wrong for him, but that's another story. Also on the bill, the, the one kind of good competitive fight, Gerard Carroll. Um, he was 11-0. and 0. He took on Jeff Afori, who's 9-1. Going into the fight, um, Afori was able to pick up the win over eight rounds on points there. So nice stuff there for Afori. I think that's a little bit of an upset kind of thing. Also on the bill, we got to see former world champion Terry Flanagan. He moved to 26 and 2. Uh, sorry, 36 and 2. My apologies. It was an eighth round points win against J. Ro Duran, who's now. 14-7, and seven. Flanagan was actually cut himself above his left eyebrow in round 5. Um, he said after the fight that he wants the big names and stuff like that. I don't know why he's been treading water. I mean, he lost to Regis Progre, and since then he's just been fighting journeyman. I don't understand it at all. His move up to 140 has been absolutely dreadful, to be honest. He, he moved up, he boxed uh, Maurice Hooker. Of course, he... He uh, he lost that fight, and then he lost his O, and then he went on to, to fight um, Regis Progre, as I said. He didn't get stopped, even though he was down. He got back up, he fought on, you know, he provided a tough test there for Regis Progre, and since then, he's decided to really drop down in level and box journeyman. I really can't understand the point in it, but um, he says he wants the big fights. Hopefully, he's telling the truth. Friend of the show, though, Terry Flanagan. Uh, also on the bill, Natasha Jonas, now 9-1, and one, a TKO for her in two rounds against Bianca Majlaf, who's now 3-4. and four. Like I say, quite a star-studded left side of the bill there. Uh, moving out now, stateside to the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City, Utah, USA. Heavyweight contender, slash prospect, I suppose, Ju- Junior Farr, now 19-0, and 0, a guy that holds a win in the amateurs, I believe, over Joseph Parker. Um, he was able to beat Devin Vargas, now 21-6. and 6. That one was for the interim WBO Oriental heavyweight title. Vargas was down twice in the fight, but lost unanimously over 10 rounds, quite wide death for Junior Farr. Um, wow. On that... Wow. Uh, sorry, go on. Uh, one of those guys is... Uh... One of my old foes, if you want to say, uh, Devin Vargas. I fought him in the amateurs when I was 15 years old, 16 years old. <laughs> and he beat me in the amateurs. He was actually a pretty good amateur. I, I think he was an Olympic ultimate. Uh, but I, I fought him way back. So when I heard his name, it kind of made me kind of chuckle. But yeah, it was just a little history. But he beat me a couple times in the amateurs. But obviously, it's a different story as a professional. But go ahead, man. I'm sorry. I, I didn't know. All right, all right, all right, then, all right. So 2020 version of Eddie Chambers against 2020 version of Devin <laughs> Vargas. Talk to me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, I think just because of the story, then it would be interesting. But aside from the accomplishment, I mean, I'm stuck with the story. The accomplishments are just like so much, you know, so lopsided. I mean, him as an amateur, he's done great things as an amateur, but it's a professional I mean, you know, so he like, kicked the lure, let's just say it that way. But, he was a he was a you know pretty good fighter as a young guy, and you know I guess like I said he can go early, but as a professional it just doesn't make any sense. You know if I mean I guess at this point it would be something interesting to put together just to you know have two older guys who fight as, as young youngsters fighting. I mean I guess that can kind of be interesting, but who buy it? Nobody knows either one of those really at this point. I mean kind of don't be a little bit, but that's it. Now go ahead. So what you're saying is you'd be whooping that ass. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I like the American accent on it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think you have to ask him. And I, probably, I, think, I, I think you might agree. You know what I mean? But we'll see. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you look down his record and, you know, um, 
when you analyse that that loss that he had on the weekend, just just put it under the the microscope there. Obviously, Junior Far, this this uh, you know the guy holds a, an amateur win over Joseph Parker. Um, he's now nineteen and zero with ten KOs. But really, it, it doesn't really look great on paper because he's the only man to have to have beaten Vargas by decision. Other than that, Vargas has been knocked out in every loss, and that that. Um, yeah, that throws me back to March 2018, where Andy Ruiz knocked him out in a round. Uh, Brazil, Dominic Brazil, knocked him out in three rounds, and there's been a few other opponents at lesser levels that have knocked him out as well. Jason Bergman, um, Andre Warzik, the Polish fighter, and Kevin Johnson back in 2009 stopped him in six rounds when Johnson was undefeated a long time ago. That was, um, but yeah. Leave it, leaving that one there. Moving, moving actually down on the undercard. This is quite sad, actually. Um, um, yeah, super middleweight contender, I guess. Dennis Duglin, friend of the show. They call him, of course, the mama's boy. He gets trained by his mother. Um, he goes into every fight these days saying, if I lose, I'm going to retire. And he actually lost. It's, it's uh, the first time that he's lost for a while. He took on a guy here. I say a guy. Excuse the pun. The guy's name is Mike Guy. Um, he, he actually he actually was able to win a, a split decision over eight rounds. So one judge gave it to Duglin by two. The other judge Judge gave it to Guy by two, and then the other judge, I believe it was Dan first, he gave it to Mike Guy by four rounds. So, not quite sure how genuine Dennis Duglin is when he when he says these things. Quite often he says if he loses, he's going to give away his purse. But um, <laughs> one thing that was real funny, I saw pictures of the weigh-in, um, Eddie, and you know, Dennis Duglin, quite a sharp guy, you know, his beard's always on point, his trim's always on point, you know, he's he's ripped, yeah. and then the other guy showed up to the weigh-in wearing a nipple ring and Crocs, I mean, wow, I mean, that, that made a statement, I even tweeted him just jokingly, Dennis Duglin, I said, man, that guy's got Crocs on, I hope he wins, and then Dennis Duglin replied saying, he had a nipple ring too, I'm secretly hoping he wins too, but unfortunately, he actually did win. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, that's terrible. And it's horrible. It actually happened. Yeah, actually, that's the worst part. He, of he it. actually did win, but um, yeah, I reached out to to Dennis Duglin just just uh, after the fight, and he basically said. He's fine. He he really str- struggled to make the weight. Um, I don't think he had much notice for the fight, but he, f- he still thought he was going to be too good for the guy, and he was completely flat. Um, he he didn't seem to be able to let his hands go, and he felt like he got outworked really by a guy that wasn't on his level. But yeah, he's he's saying he's now retired, but you know, I I, I take what he's saying there with a pinch of salt. He's quite a trickster, Dennis Duglin, a real character. Moving out now to Germany at the Hall Messi Arena in San. And how over here, Dominic Bozell, um, now 30 and 1, a TKO in round 11 against Sven Fornling, who's now 15 and 2. Um, that one was for the IBO and interim WBA world light heavyweight titles. So, uh, again, those 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 type of level guys I want to see our, our very own Anthony Yard in with. So, hopefully, those fights can happen down the line. Uh, this one now. Uh, took place at York Hall, Bethnal Green, London. Again, I think some of this was on Channel 5. Um, Alex Dilmagani, the fight was, of course, rescheduled with Francisco Fonseca after the first fight. I think Fonseca threw up or something just before the ring walk, so they had to completely scrap the main event at last minute, and it got rescheduled for this date here. It ended up going down as a majority decision after 12 rounds. Uh, sorry, a majority dr- I'm really not on my on my game today. A majority draw after 12 rounds. That one was for the vacant IBO World Super Featherweight title. Dil Magani was cut above the left eye in the ninth round there. Um, but a good performance from Francisco Fonseca. I think he was really, really overlooked going in. On that undercard, we also got to see the brother of Francisco Fonseca, Freddie Fonseca. He got in there with John Joe Nevin, the undefeated Irishman. That one was for the vacant WBA International Super Featherweight title. John Joe Nevin was able to pick up the win unanimously over 10 rounds. Fonseca was down in the second round. Uh, but, you know, credit to him for getting up and uh, and surviving it. And, of course, John Joe Nevin, he's had, he's had such a... Uh, 
such a stop-start career, um, Eddie. I mean, I, I don't expect you to know much about this guy, but this guy, John Joe Nevin, real good amateur, turned pro, had an argument with one of his family members who then um, broke, broke I think, both of his legs, and he was out the ring for, for over a year and all that while they recovered uh, his, his legs. I don't think he could walk. I don't think they thought he could ever box again, but... Hey, wow. these, these family disputes can get quite messy. Uh, also on that undercard, the son of the promoter promoting the show, uh, Mick Hennessy, of course, the promoter. His son, Mick Hennessy Jr., wow. boxed. He's now 3-0 and with one draw, a points win over six against Richard Baba, who's now 4-7. and seven. Uh, moving out now to oh. the Emirates Arena in Glasgow, Scotland, United Kingdom. Top of the bill, let's just start there. Uh, Lee McGregor, now 8-0. and A split decision win over 12 rounds against Cash Farouk, now 13-1. and Of course, somebody's O had to go. Um, I think Farouk was the favourite going in, just about. It was for the British and Commonwealth bantamweight titles. Farouk was cut above the left eye. McGregor had a point deducted in round 10 for holding. Um... I have to say, I wasn't scoring it myself. Um, I felt like Farouk had good moments. I felt like McGregor had good moments. But literally everyone I've seen that have posted a scorecard, posted their views on the fight, I haven't seen one person yet in all this time since the fight took place. I haven't seen one person yet who scored the fight to McGregor. Everyone had it to cash Farouk. It was a close fight, but, um, you know, it kind of left a bit of a bitter taste in my mouth after that one, actually, because... I uh, felt like Farouk, in the eyes of not just myself, but everyone else, they, they certainly thought Farouk did enough to win. And, of course, it didn't happen for him there. Um, the, the home fighter, if you like, won the fight. Lee McGregor, like I say, now 8-0. and um, On the undercard, we should just give a special mention there to Kieran Smith, now 16-0. and He was able to beat unanimously over 10 rounds. Vincenzo Bevilacqua, who actually was 16-0. and Um... That one was for the WBC International Silver Super Welterweight title. Kieran Smith was cut above his left eye in the very first round due to a head clash. And I think the cut worsened as the fight went on. Um, moving out now to the... Uh, this one, I think took place, yes, this one took place in the States, it's the final card to mention of the review part, at La Fontaine Blue in Maryland, USA um, just one to look out for, of course in the pro ranks uh, he's known as the Truck Lorenzo Simpson, now 6-0 and it was a unanimous decision for him over six rounds, he took on Del Vecchio Savage who uh, who got beaten, like I say I think, I think there may have even been a knockdown in that one, not quite sure, didn't get to see it, but judging by the scorecard 60-52 um, it would have normally been 60-54 so perhaps a couple of knockdowns scored there for, for Simpson um, but yeah, still still uh, you know, improving all the time Lorenzo Simpson, certainly one to look out for, unbelievable amateur and I'm sure his pro career will be, um, will will hit the hit the heights as well, so all the best to him, but that's really it for the review part we've flown for it there, it's now time to welcome guest number one Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated super lightweight prospect. It is, of course, Mr. Keith Hunter. Keith, welcome back on the show, my man. Hey, how's it going? Very good, my friend. Very good. We last spoke back in August. It was obviously following on from your, your last fight, the win over Cameron Crow. Um, you know, we asked you back on the show this time because your next fight has just been announced. January 10th is the date. New Jersey is the state. And, of course, it happens against Shojahon Ergashev. Um, Keith, tell me what you know about Ergashev as a fighter. Um, I don't really know too much personally. You know, some of my teammates know him and the people around me, you know, I just know what I see on TV. And um, as far as that, I see he doesn't have a jab and he loads up on his, well, he's southpaw, he loads up on his backhand a lot. And um, he's kind of restricted and limited as far as the moves that he uses. Now I'm sure that you've probably had a little look at his, uh, you know, he had he had quite a quite an exceptional amateur career, really. I mean, I don't think he, you know, he went to. I'm not sure if he went to the Olympics or not, but he didn't medal. And I know that he's got something like about 200 amateur wins, something like that. So, uh, you know, when I heard he was fighting at the time, I think it was Michael Fox. I had a good look at that fight. Did you happen to see that fight at all? Yeah, that's what I'm looking at really well. Yeah, see, that's a fight, in my honest opinion, where I thought Michael Fox was uh, 
was was you know unfortunate to not get the decision. I actually felt on my card he did enough. Right, but you know he had the the, the better of the business yeah. at this moment or at that moment. Yeah, and this fight, Keith, it's um, it's it's some kind of eliminator. Am I right? Correct. Is it a final eliminator or just an eliminator? That's an eliminator that will make me mandatory. <clears throat> Excuse me. It will make me mandatory for a title shot. And that is with which <clears throat> sanctioning body again? Um, I believe WBA. WBA. Okay, perfect, perfect. So, because um, cause I remember before we did a couple interviews, and I think I may have announced you as a welterweight, but 140 really is, is the division that you're gunning at. Um yeah, so have you have you kind of been you know paying attention to the champions? Obviously, we we seen recently some fantastic fights unfold at one forty, like Hooker Ramirez, like Taylor Progre. Um, I think we probably spoke about Hooker Ramirez last time, but Taylor Progre, what a fight! Did you happen to see it? I really didn't sit down and watch it. I, I just know the gist of it. Okay. Okay, and of course, um, you you and your brother Mike, you're uh, you know you're gaining reputations of pretty much fighting anybody. Um, talking of which, of course, your older brother boxes on the Joshua Ruiz undercard in Saudi Arabia against Alexander Povetkin. Um, talk to me about that fight because I know that you you probably studied Povetkin just a little bit as well when you when you found out a fight had been made. <laughs> yeah. Um... Man, I'm I'm happy for my brother. They finally given him, you know, the good the good name fights that he needs and deserves. And it's gonna be on the best platform ever, which will be the zone over there in Saudi Arabia, you know, under the Ruiz Joshua undercard. They'll be the co main. And um, you know, uh Pavekian forty. He he's a little older. Um He's still tough, but um, my brother's really used to fighting those big heavyweights, those big guys. So they're the same size as that, at the same exact size. So my brother's kind of a little more youthful and quick and a little more rhythmic. Uh, You know, I see my brother actually getting him out of there, possibly, for sure. I certainly hope so. Um, I know, obviously, you're going to be deep in preparations at that point for your own fight. So I'm guessing you probably won't be making the trip over there to Saudi. No. Okay, so you'll be tuning in. Of course, um, I think it. I think it happens early in the afternoon. Am I right? Um, I'm not exactly sure the exact time. Um, but yeah, you know the time is uh is different than ours. I'm pretty sure it would be afternoon. Yeah, I think it happens around about four p.m. Or even earlier, actually, your time. It might be around about noon Vegas time, actually. It's a, it's a weird one. But anyways, um, the, the main event mm-hmm. on that card, Keith, obviously Joshua Ruiz. I've been asking everyone in recent weeks who they believe wins that one, if it's going to be repeat or revenge. How do you see that one unfolding? Man, um, I, I think Ruiz is going to get it. Um, I've just kind of been seeing who's um, in – well, my brother's in Ruiz's camp actually getting him ready. Yeah. And and um, I think who Joshua, some of his camp. I just think that Ruiz has a little bit better sparring partners if you kind of look. Um, and then you know the confidence that uh, he beat him in. So he's carrying a, a you know amazing amount of confidence coming in. You know, so I see really Ruiz getting it again. But it's definitely going to be um, interesting because we're going to see how well uh, Joshua makes adjustments. You know, we'll see what, what 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 he does and who's who's telling him right. You know, because uh, if you look at that loss at that moment in time, he didn't know what he got hit with. So, and another rematch that takes place this weekend out there in the states, Wilder Ortiz two. Um, you know, the first fight was was was. You know, a decent fight. I felt I felt like Ortiz had his moments. I can't believe Wilder didn't touch down in parts of that fight. But ultimately, you know, he was knocked out, Ortiz. The rematch happens. He looks in phenomenal shape, Ortiz. Do you see the result being any different from the first one? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really pulling for Ortiz, really. Um, <laughs> I think, I hope, this is like Ortiz's last real shot. You know, I think he has... The attributes still, even though he's getting a little older himself as well. But uh, I do see him making uh, the adjustments that he needs. But then again, Wilder has that equalizer. So he can mess up all every second of every round. And that last second could, you know, is the eraser. It can get, get him out of mistake. 
So. And your your own fight prediction, if you have one, Keith. I mean, you said it there. You don't feel like Ergashev really possesses much of a, you know, much of a, a jab, if you like. Obviously, you've got a good jab yourself. You've got a powerful, a powerful backhand. So does he. Um, do you see it going the distance? This one? How do you see it? Um, of course, I don't want it to go the distance. I'm really going to go for the knockout, being that it's on uh, the Showtime and a good platform. So if I get this guy out of here. You know, I'm 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 gonna go for it for sure. Um, but um, again, we're both big punchers, so I don't really know how much of a chin he has. I know my chin is very good, so um, I definitely don't think it's gonna go the distance. But then again, uh, it just may. You know, I think that you know it, it's it's definitely gonna steal the night for sure because I think I you know like I said I, I'm very comfortable with southpaw so we'll see <laughs> we certainly will and just finally Keith just a closing message of course to your UK supporters that will be listening that will be backing you to beat Ergashev come January 10th what's your message for those guys man I love y'all um, I can't wait to be back in London and the UK over there <laughs> Um, appreciate the support and one love everybody one love everybody listen Keith it is always a pleasure my friend you know that best of luck for January 10th in New Jersey and we'll definitely catch up sometime after the fight for sure most definitely Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. Uh, we usually discuss the news I as of course isn't here but the news that I do have um, Emmanuel Navarrete boxes Francisco um, Horta, and also on the same card, Jerwin Ancajas boxes Miguel Gonzalez. That one, Saturday, December 7th, obviously a top-ranked card there on ESPN+. Plus. That one takes place um, in Mexico, actually. Also, in other news, Sonny Edwards will be boxing for the British Super Flyweight title against... Against Marcel Braithwaite, obviously there's been a bit of a uh, little bit of beef between the two. Um, I saw a, a little clip with with Marcel Braithwaite, and he was basically saying, "I don't know why Sonny Ed- Edwards has been saying no one wants to fight him. I'm up for the fight. He's been talking, 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 and you know, let's get it on." So I like the attitude from Braithwaite. Hopefully, the fight is a good one. It's it's going to be on a real bumper pack show there. Obviously, Dubois on the card, Archie Sharp. It's a real, real brilliant, brilliant night of boxing um, there on on the 21st of December in London at the Copper Box Arena, a Frank Warren show. Um, Also, we should mention January the 11th, Jesse Hart takes on um, Joe Smith Jr., a clash there at light heavyweight. No belt on the line, but I tell you what, that is going to be excellent there. Both men can really punch. Um, Jesse Hart, I feel like, is probably perhaps just a level above, a little bit more clean cut if you like uh, Joe Smith Jr very much a workman like type of guy I got a lot of respect for him I think he was on a building site for for uh, for for many years during his career then of course he he had an excellent I think it was 2016 where he knocked out a few guys including when he knocked Bernard Hopkins out of the ring um so yeah great yeah. fight there great fight did you want to say something on it No no yeah I was I was thinking of Jesse uh, you know I used to spar Jesse when he was a kid He's gotten better, but there's some things that he used to do that he, that if he could, you know, tap back into that, you know what I mean? I, I, you don't want to be amateur, which is a professional, no, no doubt about it, but a lot of the things he did as an amateur really had me believing that he had a heck of a future. And, you know, fighting a guy like Joe Smith, it should be a good fight for him. It should be something that he can kind of showcase his boxing ability. And he really needs to lean on that more than trying to, you know, get guys out with one punch. You know what I mean? That's, you know, it, it, you know if you have the ability – like, you know, look at Floyd Mayweather. Look at guys like that. They make the fight easy. Floyd was knocking a lot of guys out as he when he was in the lighter weights. But as he moved up, he had to change his, you know, he had to change his, uh, his style slightly. You know what I mean? He couldn't, you know, you can't go in head first. Not saying he was doing that, but you can't be all, you can't be guns blazing all the time. So I would just like for him to tap a little bit more to what he did, as a, you know, more as an amateur, a little more boxing. Not saying run around, but just, you know, just stick to that a little more, especially with this guy Joe Smith, who's punched pretty good. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, as a pro, I think there's still a lot more to come from Jesse Hart. I mean, he's got those two losses, but of course they both came to the same man. They both came to Gilberto Ramirez, the the, the former WBO World Super Middleweight Champion. It was, you know, two fights back, to, well, not back to back, they had a few fights in between, but back to back challenges for for um, the, the world title there. And um, he, he came up short just just about, literally, in, in, in both fights, really. He really did come close. But, you know, last time out, a brilliant win over Sullivan Barrera. That, that you know, that was quite a statement there, the way he beat him. And, um, yeah, he's he's on form at the minute. So, so all the best to him. Um, yeah. That's really it for the news, though. Moving on to the preview part of the show here. This one takes place tomorrow at the Caesars Palace Dubai. In, in Dubai. Um, on this card over here, we have Jack Catterall, 24 and 0, of course, patiently waiting um, for the for the uh, for the Jose Ramirez fight, I believe, for the for the uh, WBO world title at 140. Um, yeah, he's in a 10 rounder against Timo Schwartzkopf, who is 20 and 3. Also on the card, Vijender Singh, the the Indian superstar, former actor. Um, a Bollywood actor, former police officer, now turned professional uh, professional fighter. He, he juggled a few different careers at the same time. He was a real good amateur, people forget. 11-0, he's in a 10-rounder against Charles Adamu. Can't believe he's still fighting, 33-14. and 14. Uh, Thomas Patrick Ward, also on the bill. Again, I've got to just keep saying, you know, I've got to say this. Every time I see him fighting a guy that just seems to be levels and levels below him, I, I just don't understand what he's doing. He's still a young guy. I think he's only about 25 or 26 but he's 28 and 0 he showed he's a class class fighter um he got a brilliant win on an undercard in the states i think earlier this year and i just don't know what he's doing he's, he's boxing here martin casillas who's 20 and 11 with a draw in in dubai it just makes no sense but all the best to him um Moving out now to York Hall. Again, this one takes place tomorrow night. It's on Sky Sports. Um, very interesting, this this kind of... It's like a tournament, basically, Eddie. And it's it's over 10 rounds. Obviously, it's not... You don't win a fight, then box the same night or anything like that. You know, they're 10-round fights. It's not like a prize fighter thing. But, you know, it happens yeah. on a series of dates. And it happens all quite quick quite quickly within a few months of each other it's called the golden contract tournament the winner of the actual tournament ends up landing um you know a contract with a top promoter i don't know if it's going to be a promoter in the states or a promoter in the uk but it's like a six-figure contract for a few fights and stuff like that so it's brilliant stuff for the winner but um there's there's a guy that was boxing in it i don't know if you remember him but you know, he he was quite a big name a couple of years ago. O'Hara Davies, he's a one forty fighter now, and interestingly, yeah. he had a bit of a kind of um, scuffle with another guy because because basically they, they their their names go in a hat kind of thing, and if you if you draw. It's like a, I think there's blue balls and red balls in this hat. And if you draw a blue ball, you get to pick your opponent. And then you're boxing them literally three days later because the draw took place on Tuesday. So there's no real time to, to make adjustments if you unfortunately land a southpaw or something like that. So anyway, um, O'Hara Davies had a scuffle. Um, it, it, a little bit of it was caught on camera, um, you know. They got in each other's face, and it looked quite serious. Anyway, O'Hara Davies had a scuffle with another guy that was boxing in the same tournament, Tyrone McKenna. So both of them said, "If if I draw a blue ball, I'm definitely going to pick him." And you know, we we all we, you know we we like a bit of beef, and everyone was excited for that. And then, of course, the day of the draw, O'Hara Davies had a clash with another guy who's fighting on the on the same thing called Darren Surtees, and the same thing kind of happened. They almost came to blows. People were trying to separate them. So straight. Straight away, I was thinking, please let O'Hara Davies either fight Tyron McKenna or Darren Surtees. Those are the fights I want to see. But unfortunately, every single man involved in a bit of beef ended up um, on the on the other end. They didn't pick a blue ball. They ended up being picked by guys that picked blue balls. So all the fights I wanted to see didn't end up happening. But, but anyway, right. hopefully they all win and, and we get to see it in the next round. But um, the the you know the fights that we are going to see, we'll get to see. Logan Yoon, he's a guy who is based in Hawaii, um, 21 years of age, 16-0 with 
12 KOs. I think he was quite a good amateur. He picked to, to fight O'Hara Davies, 19-2. and two. Um, Also on the card, Mohamed Mamoun, 21-3, and three, former... I think he was... Was he European champion or he might have boxed? I think he boxed Sam Eggington. Um, he's in a 10-rounder against Darren Surtees, who is... 12-0, and, and Mikey Saki 8-2, and two. he's in a 10-rounder against Tyrone McKenna, 19-1 and one with one draw, so hopefully the right men win there, and um, we get to see those juicier fights happen in the next round, but still definitely tune into that one, should be interesting uh, moving out now to Germany we have over here Jack Kalkai 26-4, and four. he puts his WBO European Super Welterweight title on the line against Jamma Saidi, who's 16-0 and 0. um Tyrone Zuega also on the bill, 24 and 1 with one draw. He's in a 12 rounder against Yusuf Kangwell, who's 19 and 3 with a draw. Uh, moving out now to the Echo Arena in Liverpool, Merseyside, United Kingdom. Again, this one Saturday night. It is on 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 normal sky. Um, on the undercard, Anthony Fowler, 10 and 1. He takes on Harry Scarf, who's 8 and 0. Uh, Tom Farrell. This one could be. Could be quite interesting. Tom Farrell, 17 and 2, takes on Sean Masher Dodd, 16 and 5 with a draw. Uh, this this one probably fight of the of the undercard for me. Not 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 fight of the card because I quite like the main event. But Craig Glover, 10 and 2, takes on Chris Billum Smith, 9 and 1. That one's for the vacant Commonwealth Cruiserweight title. Uh, James Tennyson, 25 and 3. He's in a 12 rounder against Craig Evans, 20 and 2 with two draws. Again, that could be real good. And the main event, of course, Callum Smith, 26 and 0. Some people would say he's the best super middleweight in the world. WBA Super World Title on the line and the WBC Diamond World Title. On the, uh, I don't even know if that's a world title. WBC Diamond Title on the line against John Ryder, 20, 28 and 4 now. John Ryder, a guy that is probably the most improved fighter I've seen. Um, obviously, we all know the story. He was he was boxing at middleweight. He lost a close decision to Billy Joe Saunders. He ended up boxing um, for the British title against Nick Blackwell, who you know, was was at the very best British level. And he ended up knocking John Ryder out. And then, of course, since John Ryder moved up in weight to super middleweight, he's been absolutely destroying everyone. So he's on a real run. The form is with him. Um, Callum Smith, you know, I'd also say the form's with him. He's he's looking really good at the minute. Obviously, a brilliant win over George Groves. Um, that's a tough fight. We've gone to the predictions on it, actually, and I should have been ready with those, but the listeners have gone with a Callum Smith KO. I'm actually going to go with Smith on points. I've got to favour Smith. Um, I really like John Ryder. I'd love, I'd love for him to win the fight. Um, on a personal level. I mean, both guys are friends of the show. I get on a lot better with John Ryder. John Ryder, you know, I'm I'm just proud of him for, for the way he's turned his career around. You know, he's been in so many 50-50 fights back-to-back, and he's been destroying his opposition. So I'd love to see him do it. It certainly is his moment, but, you know, he did, he did say to me on this very show beforehand, you know, when he was going to be in line to box the winner of Groves and Smith, he said, to be honest, I'd rather box Groves because Smith is just too big. And Groves, of course, was the favorite for that fight, and he ended up losing that fight. So here he is. He knows he's got a big size disadvantage. Um, the thing with Callum Smith, though, I just think I think it will be quite competitive because I think Callum Smith won't be overly worried, and when he's not overly worried about his opponent, sometimes he he can be a little bit lackluster. So I'd be quite surprised if he gets him out of there. Um, I think he I think he wins a close-ish kind of fight. I think he's going to have to be on the back foot. I think John will be trying to push him back. Um, but yeah, I think it's going to be quite competitive, a lot more competitive than a lot of people think. So for me, Smith wins it, but I hope I'm wrong. I do like both guys. I've got to, I've got to reiterate once again, I do like both guys. But John Ryder, I mean, what a story. What a story. You, you can't help but really, really love John Ryder. But um, Callum Smith, he's got the future. Big plans, you know. He's still undefeated. Of course, the World Boxing Super Series champion. Um, he done it. He done it in, in Saudi Arabia. You know, he's he's boxed 
you know, in a, in a couple different countries now. He's a bit more international, a bit more well known, and you know, his future you'd say is probably a bit brighter. They're talking about Canelo fights. They're talking about Golovkin. They're talking about Billy Joe Saunders in unifications. Um, so yeah, could be interesting. But I'm gonna I'm gonna just side with Smith. I think the size gets him through. Uh, moving out now to the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California, USA. Um, on this card, we get to see. Kanzu, 17-2, and two, defend his WBA World Featherweight title against Manny Robles III. Um, Manny Robles III, 18-0. I'm guessing must be the son of Manny Robles, obviously the trainer at the minute of of um, Andy Ruiz Jr., I'm guessing. Um, but yeah, 18-0. and 0, He's in a world title fight literally two weeks before um, Manny Robles will, will be in Saudi. But anyways, topping that bill, friend of the show now, we had him on a couple of weeks back, Andrew Cancio, the WBA World Super Featherweight Champion, 21-4 and four with two draws, he takes on Rene Alvarado in a rematch, of course Cancio was able to KO him a couple years back, um, Alvarado has, I think both men have moved up in weight and really improved since the first fight, so hopefully... Um, hopefully Cancio wins again. Hopefully he gets another nice knockout and he, he you know, he, he has another brilliant fight after this one. But, you know, it should be more interesting because, like I say, both men have improved, not just Cancio, who's got an interesting story. He actually decided to, to quit boxing and, and go back to his day job and then his kids begged him to, to, to return to the ring. Very, very odd. Most of the time your kids would be saying, I don't want to see you fight. But they said, we want to see you fight. And he came back and ended up winning a world title. So can't help but... Um, side with him and of course the the final bill to mention that takes place at the M in fact before we get on to that one we're talking of California here the, the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio um talking of a guy from Cali from Oakland they're talking about this uh this this rumor Eddie and and I'm going to come to you about it people are trying mm-hmm. to lure Andre Ward a happily retired man a man who retired undefeated a man who you know, didn't really have any question marks over his career in terms of he would have lost to him, he would have lost to him. No, he fought the names, in my opinion. Um, you know, he went through the weights, he did well at super middleweight, obviously he won the Super 6 tournament, beating the likes of Carl Froch and stuff like that. Um, you know, he, he moved up to light heavy, where, in my honest opinion, he probably shouldn't have even been up there. I think he was giving away too much size. He boxed Kovalev. Yeah, I thought he lost the first fight, and I think he was he was a bit a bit fortunate to get it but of course in the rematch when he was able to stop him that that just rubbed it out for me you know he he established himself um as as a true true champion at 175 as well now um yeah yeah, they're trying to lure him out for this for this uh possible canelo fight for me though i think i think he should stay retired eddie i mean i know the money would be like his you know it'd be his career highest payday but yeah, I, I don't want to see him return. I, I honestly, I honestly, I'd probably favour Canelo because he's he's just improving all the time. He's been so active, and he showed there, you know, in that fight against Kovalev, how how brilliant he was. I mean, it wasn't all his own way. Let's not forget, but the knockout was devastating. Um, I don't want to, yeah. I don't want to see, I don't want to see Ward back in the ring after this this much time out. Honestly, yeah, it's it's rough. It's rough to come back on a, on a layoff like this, especially, you know, just basically saying, hey, I'm done. You know, it is what it is. I, I did all I can do, all I want to do up to this point, and then just hanging it up. Um, to all of a sudden turn everything back on and jump in there, it's tough. I mean, you've seen it with Andre Ruiz when he came back after the injury he had, and he had to take some time off, and after these other legal things he had when he had to take time off. So it, it wasn't easy. There was, you know, it was a process to get back into it. And it's not me no different now. And he's a little older. You know, things aren't going to be as smooth. The, the, the recovery periods are going to take longer. So, you know, and then you're going in there with a with a young gun. This guy's like you said, he's getting better. He's improving. He's he, he's pushing things. He's, he's pushing the envelope with a lot of things he's doing. And um, and it's really really tough to get in there on your first fight back, especially. Now, I'm not saying that that's how they're going to do it. Maybe they're going to decide to allow Andre to come back and get a couple, you know, a couple in real quick and, and then throw the fight together. But in reality, it will be, in, you know, he's not going to be in there with no elite competition right off the bat anyway, if he was. So how is he really going to prepare for someone like Canelo? And to get mentally prepared for that, you know what I mean? I know everybody's talking about the money, and that is important, but 
the one thing that's good about Andre Ward is he got his wits and his mind, mind still about it. everything is still good. You know, you don't want to go into a fight with, you know, uh, uh, like this, and all of a sudden now you're getting banged around. You know what I mean? It's just it's not worth it for that. Now, obviously, like you said, the money is going to be crazy. It's going to be the biggest payday by far that he's ever had and probably bigger than anything he's going to get. You know what I mean? Unless he moves up the heavyweight and fights something crazy up there. But other than that, it's going to be the best he can hope for. So, I mean, it's kind of, oh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you decide what's more important to you? You know, if he's not hurting for money, he's got plenty of different jobs. He's doing a lot of commentating. He's everywhere. You know what I mean? He's doing a lot of things. So I don't know that he needs that money. I mean, that'd just be not, it'd be nice to have a little extra, but does he really need it? And if so, I mean, if he, if he just wants it, is it really worth risking health, you know, life and limb just to get back in there and do something that you're basically done with? I don't know. You know what I mean? I, you know, my situation is probably a little different than his. If I come back, it's because I'm not saying I need, need, need money because I'm fine without having a lot, but it would just give me more freedom. He has that freedom. Does he really need to put himself at risk of anything just for one more shot at it? I don't know. It just depends on what he wants. Yeah, I mean, I, I think of him um, as I kind of do the likes of Joe Calzaghe, you know, how Calzaghe retired undefeated 46-0, and you know, the best in his division um, for, 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 for lots and lots of time after that. Everyone wanted him to come out of retirement and box Carl Froch because Carl Froch was talking smack about him and stuff like that. And, you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we never got that fight. And you've got to respect Joe for saying, do you know what? It's not worth trying to come back and lose my O after I've been sitting on the couch, if you like. I'm not saying that Andre's been mm -hmm. sitting on the couch, but I don't want to see him, you know, turn up and, and, uh, risk his, his, you know, his, his undefeated streak. He's, he's almost been out of the ring three years now. So for me, he should, he should stay behind the mic, stay the other side of the ropes. Um, yeah, so that's, that's yeah. just what I think. But what do I know? Yeah, I, no, I think I think, I mean, I wouldn't say that. Oh, yeah, I mean, he couldn't come back and do well. Oh, no. But I would have to agree with you. I mean, if everything is good and you don't need anything and there's no real reason to do it, then don't. You know what I mean? Just let it go. Yeah, I agree. And the final bill, like I say, at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, uh, Marcellus Wilder, the brother of Deontay, his record five and one. He takes on Dustin Long over six rounds, two and one with two draws. Uh, Leo Santa Cruz, thirty-six and one with one draw, puts his WBA Super World Super Featherweight title on the line against Miguel Flores, friend of the show, twenty-four and two. Another interesting story, obviously, Miguel Flores. Um, he lost his older brother in the ring from boxing. His, his older brother mm. died in the ring before he even turned pro. And I said to him, did that not make you think, hey, I don't really want to box? He said, no, the complete opposite. He wanted to box. So here he is. We wish him the best. Hopefully he becomes a world champion. Uh, also on the bill, Brandon Figueroa, 20-0, and 0, of course, the younger brother of Omar Figueroa. He puts his WBA World Super Bantamweight title on the line. He was upgraded from the interim champion to the full champion recently. Uh, he puts it on the line against Julio Seja, who's 32 and 4. Remember, Julio Seja in his last fight was beating Guillermo Rigondo on the cards until Rigondo came mm. from behind and knocked him out. So that could be quite interesting. Um,. Another brilliant fight on the card, but for no belt on the line at bantamweight. Luis Neary, 30-0, and 0, the Mexican. Um, very, very good fighter, young fighter. 12-round fight against Emmanuel Rodriguez of Puerto Rico, 19-1. and 1. Again, Rodriguez's only loss came to, uh, came to Neue Inue. So, brilliant, brilliant fight, that one. I love that fight there. And, of course, top in the bill, Eddie. I've got to come to you on this one. The rematch, Deontay Wilder, 41-0 and 0 with one draw. The, the draw, of course, to Tyson Fury. He puts his WBC mm -hmm. World Heavyweight crown on the line against Luis Ortiz. King Kong, 31-1. and one. Of course, the one lost to Wilder. Um, mm -hmm. How do you see mm -hmm. it unfolding? And also, do you think that Wilder will get to 49 wins without losing a fight like Rocky Marciano? But that's another thing. Um, talk to me about the fight. Well, I will talk about that after, but yeah, uh, Ortiz, He's done. He obviously did well in the first fight, but I just think you know at this point in time, if he's come down and wait some, he, he, then he gives himself a better chance. You know, because he, I feel like it's going to be more of a distance fight. I mean, it doesn't seem like it at first. You know what I mean? When you think a Wilder, you're thinking one punch knockout, but I think Wilder's shot is to knock a guy out. 
You understand what I'm saying? And that's his main focus. He's not thinking about winning a decision. He's not thinking about that, you know, any of those types of things. In fact, most of the time when I see him in fights, he's not the better boxer. And, you know, so disrespect to him. It's just, that's just the fact. And in this fight is no different, but Ortiz is going to have to make sure that he doesn't show his age. He's going to have to be able to, to use that boxing ability to be able to land those big shots. And I just don't know at this stage in his career, if he'll be able to do that. Wilder's young, younger, obviously he's hungry. He still, he still wants to prove that he's, you know, the man he wants, you know, he's, he's good for whatever reason. He just, he's, 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 he's fueling his own fire. You know what I mean? He just, he's just constantly, he has a, a crazy belief in himself. You know what I mean? And I, honestly, I look at it and I just say, damn, you know, look at what he does. It's some, it's some of the things he does skill wise in the ring and it just shakes my head, but it works for him. And I don't think, Saturday night is going to be any different. I think, honestly, he's going to end up winning that fight again. I don't know if he's going to win by knockout, you know what I mean? But I I would think that that's what's going to happen. I feel like that's more his, in his ballpark. That's more of uh, his chance. I don't really think he's good. He, I, don't, I don't want to say he couldn't win a decision against uh, Ortiz, you know what I mean? Because I just think Ortiz uh, can box, and I think he can obviously control the fight and win a decision. But I just don't think – that he, you know, that he'll be able to have the gas tank. To be honest, that's why I'm saying if he's lighter in weight and he's able to go distance better, then you know Ortiz will have a better chance. But I just honestly think Wilder, middle rounds, you know, middle maybe five, maybe six. By that time, Ortiz is going to start to really slow down if he's if he hasn't been caught already, and then he's probably going to get him out of there five, maybe six. I mean, I I would uh, the first fight I was picking Ortiz. You know what I mean? And it actually looked like I was going to be right, but. But honestly, I'm looking at the situation, just looking how Ortiz was in that first fight, and I'm just like, what? It's been what? How long since that fight? A couple, a year or so, or maybe more. And you know, what he what has he gotten a year older? You know what I mean? And, and his skills are still maybe still there, and his power maybe still there, but he's still a year older, maybe a little slower, and maybe not. And, and obviously, if he's going to be in there heavy again, eh, it's going to end up being a very similar situation, or probably even worse for him. Yeah, it's been a it's been a year and eight months, I believe, since that first fight. But yeah. um, you know, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, just just real quick, I, I I forgot to mention the Luis Neri and Emmanuel Rodriguez fight. We went to the prediction league on that. The listeners very very close. It was 34 percent going with Luis Neri on points. Um, I'm gonna go by the way, mm-hmm. Luis Neri by a KO. I'm gonna also have to um, hit up Ayaz, who by the way isn't with me because he's just randomly flown to Germany without telling me. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, Luis <laughs> Luis Neri by a KO, 33 percent. Rodriguez on points, 33 percent. But just passed there by Luis Neri on points, 34%. So just 1% there um, for, for, you know, getting getting Neri on points over the line. And the listeners are going with Wilder by a KO, 66%. And in second place, Ortiz by a KO, 29%. But yeah, I'm going to go Wilder yeah. by a KO as well. Um, yeah. You know, you're right about this. You know, we don't know how old Ortiz is. Um, one thing yeah. I will say since that Wilder fight, I mean, he knocked out Razvan Kajanu in two rounds, but other than that, he went 10 rounds with Travis Kaufman till he stopped him out in the, t- till he, uh, knocked him out in the last round, the 10th and final round. And then in his very last yeah. fight back in March this year, he went the distance with Christian Hammer, a man that I think Fury stopped in about five rounds, uh, or eight rounds, I yeah. think it was. So, um, yeah, you know, he hasn't yeah. looked that impressive since then. So, so to say that he's going to, you know, massively improve, the only difference I'm seeing is he looks in phenomenal shape all of a sudden and he's got a bit of hair, Yeah, you know? <laughs> he's got quite a nice... Yeah, well, that's hair. different. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, and, and the hair might help, but no. But anyway, seriously, <laughs> him being in better shape and lighter gives him a better chance. Yeah. Even if he hasn't looked good against other guys, if he's in there with a guy like Wilder and he can just continue to box. And if, like, if you look at the, if you look at Tyson and what Tyson did with Wilder, he wasn't doing a whole lot of craziness. He was, you know, he was just boxing. You know what I mean? He didn't throw an extreme amount of punches. He just made sure that Wilder couldn't land his and he was land, he was able to land, you know, shots here and there, pot shot here. You know what I mean? Little, little counter shots things that offset Wilder's offense and his wild shots and things that he normally does, his unorthodox style. And he, you know, he just kept him at bay and kept him under control. If you can do that, you can still win a boxing match. Like there's nothing wrong with Ortiz getting in there and boxing Wilder to a decision. But I don't think 
in his mind, that's what he's going to be looking for. I think just as Wilder's looking for a knockout, so is he. And that's where the problem lies. If he goes in there looking for a knockout, he's going to be available to get knocked out. And that's Wilder's chance to win. And Wilder, it, and it's crazy. Wilder's been a champion reigning for a while now, right? And he still has that has to knock you out kind of thing. Because if he doesn't, I feel like most of the guys who are anywhere near elite is going to be outboxing him up to the time he catches you. You understand what I'm saying? So with Ortiz, he has to think about, look, let me just stay alive in here. Let me just keep touching this guy, putting my hands on him. You know what I mean? Not too much, just enough. And make sure I stay defensively conscious, keep my legs under me, and not get too crazy. You know what I mean? And it, it, Tyson Fury put out the blueprint. If you can stick to it, you have a shot. Just don't let him hit you <laughs> with that right hand. And if you can figure out how to stop it, then maybe you have a chance to win. But, you know, I don't know. Like 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 we said, Ortiz is a proud man. You know, I'm, I'm this, I'm going to dominate it. No, you can dominate in other ways. Forget the knockout. Go in there and try to win a boxing match. Yeah, we'll have to wait and see. But, um, no, you know, it's, it's a decent fight. I'm not, I'm not like, counting down the hours because I feel like, you know, he had his. He yeah, had sure. such a big moment against Wilder, and still Wilder somehow yeah. stayed on his feet in the first fight, and you know he knocked him out huh. in the end. So I mean, we'll see. A, a little bit of Go on. yeah. I mean, it was, I don't want to say home home cooking because I don't. I don't even know where to fight. Well, I don't even remember. I don't even care. But you know, with with Wilder being the man, you know what I mean, and they, them wanting the fight with you know him with Anthony Joshua, or then you know, now Tyson Fury, they they want those fights still to happen. So you got to make sure that whatever you're doing you got to do it well. Like, if he's going to win a decision, he's going to have to put hands on him. He's going to have to control. He's going to have to make sure that Wilder doesn't have a chance in the fight. You know what I mean? At all, to win a decision. And even then, man, we didn't see some crazy decisions. But I'd rather that than him get caught with something stupid and get knocked out. You know what I mean? If I'm if I'm a backer of Ortiz. So, you know what I mean? He just, he just really, he has to, like I said, he has to keep his feet under him. You know what I mean? Hopefully he's lighter and he's in better, he's in good shape and he can win a boxing match. But, you know, but like I said, I'm going wild in the middle rounds because that's just where the way it seems like it's going to be. Yeah, Ortiz has said I think this week that he's he's got his plan and his plan. Um, you know, he, he didn't really discuss it or break it down, but his plan is that it's going to work and I'm going to end up stopping it. Um, you know, before before the final before the final bell. I think we all probably what? agree with that that it will end at some point before the final bell. I don't think it does go to this, the, the the distance in any crazy world, to be honest, uh, Eddie. Sometimes you see two punches in yeah. there, nah, but sometimes you see yeah. two punches in there together and you say, "There's no way this is." going to go the distance but i think pretty much pretty much <laughs> yeah. every wilder fight it's just it's so hard to ever see it going the distance and that's why he's only been the distance yeah. i think is it is it two times in in 42 fights yeah yeah twice and that was um obviously the fury the and the first yeah. Stavern, was it Stavern? Stavern, Stavern, yep. yeah yeah yep yep that's it <laughs> so it is what it is man it is what it is but yeah <laughs> Of course, we'll be tuning in into that one. Um, Sky Sports are, are really delivering this week. Like I say, don't miss any of it. Friday night for the Golden Contract Tournament at York Hall. Saturday night for the John Ryder and Callum Smith card in Liverpool. And then, of course, the early hours of Sunday, uh, the Wilder card. Again, it's all on Sky. So free shows in a matter of about about 30 hours something like that so lots and lots to get involved in um just before i let you go eddie i just want to quickly sign you out as always i i really appreciate you coming on and filling in for eyes it's always brilliant our listeners must love it because uh you talk a lot more sense than anyone that comes on this show so i appreciate it <laughs> thanks man i appreciate it you know I, I you know i never have a problem coming in man helping you out if you need me you know even if you know you just wanted me to come along just to talk some crap like you do here a little bit it's, it's, it's no problem i enjoy it you know what i mean i really appreciate you having me on thank you very much eddie a very frequent mm -hmm. free regular panelist of the of the box hard podcast but yeah. that is everything just before we wrap up part two the final thing to do of course is to welcome our second and final guest Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former four-weight world champion. It is, of course, Mr. Nonito Donen. Nonito, welcome back on the show, my friend. 
Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure, Manito. It seriously is. Uh, we last spoke back in September. Obviously, you know, it was the build-up to the Inue fight. That's really the only place to start. Thursday, November 7th in Japan. Not only one of the best fights of 2019, but arguably one of the best fights I've ever watched live. Unbelievable fight. Please talk me through it from your point of view. Well, um, I, you know, in the beginning, um, Inoue tried to c- come at me. I felt that he was a little bit aggressive coming in. And um, I think that I established myself early on um, the power as well as as, uh, as as my demeanor that I'm here to stay. I'm here to fight, you know. And, and, and I think he kind of got that respect and got that energy from me. And um, so he started to change a little bit of it, try to use more jab and more movement. And, um, you know, I mean, I can't, I can't really quite remember everything else, but I remember hitting him and hit one big left hook and he started bleeding. And then he caught me good in the mid round of the fifth, I think. You know, I mean, just pretty much mainly this, <laughs> all just going on in my head was, uh, was just, I'm, you know, I'm going to take whatever you can dish out, you know, and I think he was, pretty much the same thing, uh, you know. Um, one thing that really truly surprised me was how tough he was. You know, he was he was incredibly tough for, you know, I mean, I think he, he tucked his, his, his head well enough that I wasn't catching him in the temple or the chin and catching him in that right, in that, in that cheek, the, the toughest part of our, of our bone, which is, you know, which is why his orbital was fractured and his nose, but those are the toughest area. And I kept hitting those and landing in that area. And um, I think that's why he was able to withstand the punches unless I think it was the ninth round when I got him really good at the chin, which was the strike and, um, and hurt him really bad, you know, and, and I had the choice to see whether to create the opportunity or wait the opportunity, wait for the opportunity, which was how I was able to counter him. And at that moment, uh, I, I decided to, to see if I can get him to throw that, that same punch where I can counter him again. And, and I thought that that would end the fight, but he was smart enough to not do it and, and lost my chance in, in taking, taking him out. And then um, in the 11th round, uh, you know, we're, we're just... I don't, you know, I, he wasn't, I, we were both not tired in that fight. I, you know, we both have a lot of power, but we both were really, didn't care about our, our exhaustion or anything. I, I don't remember being tired in a fight as well as, as, I don't think he was tired as well. Um, but that punch and the liver shot, that was, that was, that was the defining moment of the, of the, of the fight. He caught me really good and, oh man, it, 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 it got me in the right time the right moment where I was breathing in and caught it at the right spot. And I, I was like, what do I do? Do I, do I just I try to suck it up? But then one hit and I'm over and I take the knee and just, just try to go for broke. This is, this is his hometown. You know, a lot of things were going on in my head at that time, you know? So I was, I decided to take the knee and then, and, and take as much time as I can to get up from, from the count. And then I recovered a lot. From, from the count and then uh and from taking the knee and I was able to pull out of that 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 uh that that round you know with with my left hook and the last round you know, we just try to go all out you know I, I thought I, I thought it was a very fun fight it was a fun fight for me and I really truly really enjoyed it and I, I <laughs> if I could do it again I would love to do it again <laughs> No, I mean, it's brilliant hearing you talk about it that in depth. I mean, it was such a a magnificent fight, you know, it had everything. And um, even like, you know, like just little special things that perhaps not everyone picks up on. I remember even in the fifth round, I think you got caught with quite a big right hand from Inoue and, you you know, you found yourself on the ropes and he kind of went in for the kill, like he, he tried to swarm you. And I remember it was almost like you were playing possum a little bit because you came back off the ropes with like a massive left hook that just, just missed him. And I thought, if that connected, he's going. Like, you know, you still completely knew what you were doing. It just, it was a brilliant, brilliant fight. And, uh... I want to ask you, obviously, you know, there was one card in particular that was very, very close. Uh, the 113-114 scorecard, which literally would have meant if you didn't take a knee, that judge would have given you the fight. Um, looking back, does 
you know, does that play on your mind at all? Because it was such a close fight, and that you know played it played a part in one card at least. Yeah, I mean, I, I even I knew it. The the look in his in his face and surprise of of the decision, you know, and and um he he knew he I mean it was a close fight I, I thought that it could have gone either way and I think that he cemented it by knocking me down with a body shot you know and and I got no complaint um I thought that that uh, the judge with the one thirteen one fourteen was an incredible judge a very fair judge you know everybody can see how close that fight was it was a back and forth action I definitely took the advantage of in 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 uh in my aggression you know i don't think that there would be no fight if if i didn't really step out the gas you know i came out there to fight that's what it was and and, and he knew he knew that you know and he just gave me a biggest respect and it was incredible incredible uh he's an incredible guy with incredible um talent in, in boxing you know um but i really truly believe that he was a very close fight it was a very close fight it was a it was a back and forth action. He heard me. I heard him. He heard me. I heard him. You know, um, I pressed the fight. I wasn't afraid of him. You know, and he wasn't afraid of me. And you know, and that's what <laughs> everybody loved it. You know, everybody loved it. We, we, me, and him gave our soul into that into that fight. And, and uh, you know, uh, fortunately, I came in, I came in um, healed and 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 you know, just bruises and 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 all. You know, and and and. and Unfortunate for him, but it gives him the time to think of 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 his next next um next next decision or next fight. You know, it gives him time to heal. He's still young, and he can he can he can uh can heal from that really quickly. Um, for me, I'm just grateful. My my my, my I've been in this game for such a long time. I think my skin and my bones gotten too thick where I get bruised, but I, that's pretty much what I get in fights now. <laughs> But I've got to be honest, Nanita, I mean, some people, looking back now, it almost seems quite funny that some people didn't even think you could make bantamweight for the for the quarterfinal of the World Boxing Super Series. I mean, you know, in some people's eyes, you were you were fortunate in the Burnett fight that he had to be pulled out with the injury. Obviously not the way you wanted to become a champion again. Then, of obviously, the... Uh, the Tete fight where he pulled out a few days before your fight, you ended up boxing Stephen Young, a guy, you know, that just wasn't nowhere near your level, really. You showed us that with a brutal KO. You couldn't have really had an easier route to the final. And then when you got there, people were expecting you to get blasted out in a couple of rounds because this guy was, you know, he was he was invincible. He was a monster. Do you take credit, you know, do, do you take a lot of credit in yourself, a lot of pride in yourself with the good performance? Or are you disappointed with, with you know, the fact that you didn't get the win? Like, where are you on that? Because they're both kind of polar opposites. How do you sit on that? I'm both. I'm both on that. Yeah. I'm both. You know, I, I, you know, I'm very disappointed because I train hard and I have the, um, the, the confidence that I was going to beat him. I had the confidence that I was more powerful than him. You know, I had the confidence going in there that I was going to surprise everybody. You know, at the same time, I'm really proud of myself because no one really gave me, no one really gave me anything, um, you know, for this fight. No one really, really thought it was going to be something. And, and the whole world knows now that, you know, I'm, I'm not a pushover. No, not, not the monster can't, can't, you know, not, not a monster can, <laughs> can devour me. You know, I can fight in par with the monster. So, so um, that's just how you know. Uh, that's just how I am. I'm, I'm here to stay, and I love the game, and I'm gonna continue to train harder. You know, with the right motivation, like I did in the tournament, I feel I feel really good. But at the same time, as in your question, you know, I, I'm in both sides, and that you know, yeah. a lot of I, I wanted it so bad, and I felt confident that I was gonna take it. You know, and um, and at the same time, I'm I'm proud of myself. Everybody's proud of me, my whole team, and that's what matters a lot to me. And I want to ask you, what was his power like? Again, you know, we're hearing that his power is just absolutely frightening. But what is it like matching it up, I suppose, in some mythical pound-for-pound way to the likes of a Nicholas Walters or someone like that? Uh, you know, I mean, Walters was a lot bigger than I was. And, and I think that, I, you know, he caught me. I think Walters really caught me in the back of the head or behind the ear. Um, and that's what hurt me most you know it's where we're very vulnerable um in comparison to the guys on my weight i would say he's similar to dick Tarchinian. uh the second fight where i was very sick and i was taking all the punches and i was you know it, it has a similar feeling of a heavy punch strong you know um he just has more speed 
it comes down to it. But I think that that uh, it had a similar similar effect or similar similar uh, uh, power as as Victor Chunin, where there's a there's a bit of a push and the same time it's similar to mine, where there's a bit of, of speed into it. So I'm not sure of that. Um, but I, I felt during that fight that I was never gonna go down. At least at that, I, perhaps it was my pride that I took the punch. Like you said, in the, in the fifth round, I took it. It rocked me really good, but I was never out of my head. You know, I was still com- kind of planning to throw the left hook, you know, in my vulnerable state. Um, but, I, you know, and that's why we're very, we're very, uh, it was fun for me. <laughs> it was just a fun fight for me. And, and, and again, I, I'd love to do it again. And either during the fight or it might have been just after the fight, I can't remember now, but the commentator on, on the UK uh, telecast, he said something along the lines of, if this is the last time we've seen Lonito Denier in the ring, then what a career he's had. And I couldn't help from, from just thinking, hang on a minute, if Lonito Donaire at this age, has just had a super competitive fight with arguably the best pound-for-pound fighter in the world, in some people's book, then then that surely means Nanito could probably still beat the hell out of tons and tons of other fighters. So, you know, I was going to ask you, are you considering retiring on that? But it sounds like absolutely not. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Yeah, you know, why waste my moment in time in here? And I, I believe that I'm given time. I'm, I'm given this talent, you know, why, 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 why um, take it away from me? You know, again, for me, one of my beliefs is I don't want to sit in, in a rocking chair when I'm nine years old and, and thinking, man, I should have given another fight or two more fights or perhaps 10 fights or maybe 20 fights, you know, <laughs> whatever it is, whatever where, where it's safe for me and where my family says that I'm okay still, I'll continue to fight. And I'm sure you heard the news of of your former opponent Ryan Bennett. Obviously, he did box one time since since losing to you. He got a win, but you know other injuries that he's picked up in training and what have you have now forced him to retire uh, prematurely from boxing. Have you got any words of, of support at all for Ryan, a guy that I know you kind of grew close to around that fight that you you guys had? Well, I wish him the best in life. You know, we find our path and we find and we make those decisions and. and... We own up to this decision and you know i wish him that he finds the success that he's looking for in terms of life in terms of, of career and whatever it may be i i wish him the best of everything and um obviously there was the the kind of well documented story about how um you again for those that may not know i want you to just to, to just tell them you you'd promised your 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 boys that you'd be taking the muhammad ali trophy home for them um basically from my understanding because i think someone tweeted something earlier today or yesterday that was quite wrong and you corrected them um you know you you basically asked in you is it okay if i take this trophy home because i i want to i want to keep that promise to my boys and that is what happened am i right in saying that well after the uh, before the fight i was again i was very confident in, in beating in way i it was just it was just one of those things that i felt and i i can see a lot of the things that he did and you know show up for that fight I promised my boys that I'm going to bring this trophy. I'm going to bring this trophy, and I'm going to, you know, when you wake up in the morning, I'll be here. That's my promise, you know. And Papa never lied, you know. So, so I, I said that to my boys, and then, um, and then after the fight, you know, I actually cried. I cried because I fell short on on my promise. You know, um, it was the first time I cried after we were losing the fight. You know, I really wanted that fight so bad, and then um, and uh, I I cried. You know, and so I asked their team and, and Mr. Honda and uh, everybody else, you know, and even in New York, after after I saw him that uh, if I can take the the the, the trophy for um for, you know for at least one day, I promise my kids that I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll bring it to them when they wake up in the morning, <clears throat> and um. And you know he he nodded he nodded and he was just that uh, he was just happy to, to you know at that time he was just happy so <laughs> whatever I said he's like go for it whatever you need you know um, so uh, I brought it and when I came back home, when I when I came in got the trophy the next day my kids woke up he came in my eldest son came in started jumping up and down in celebration you know screaming and yelling and and I had to sit him down you know and I told him that hey this is this is not Papa's trophy. This is 
the winner's trophy. And then he looked at me and said, we lost. And he started crying. You know, and you saw the video in, in my in my uh, in my social media. He just started crying. You know, and and I felt bad for him. But I just told him that sometimes when you give your all, that's all you really need to do. Sometimes you win, and sometimes you won't win. Yeah, you know, sometimes you lose, and you just gotta keep your head up. You know, that's just part of our life that we just move on from it. But one thing that I want to tell you guys is that when I promise something, I'm gonna go through with the promise and this is the trophy and I said I was going to bring it with you so you guys can see it and I brought the thing you know I was just kind of teaching my kids that your words is golden your words is a very important part of, of, of being a man and and when you say something you have to do it you know and I brought it to my kids and then uh you know and then I I just said I just did another video to uh, congratulate in new way after that because he you know I was grateful that he was he that he allowed me to bring it um, and I just said to my kids, they said, congratulations, Mr. Inoue. And that's what they did, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and that's how it happened. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Nanita, man, you're, you're an amazing man. I, I promise you, man. And honestly, you're, you you know, your sons should, should never be upset about, about, about you losing because I tell you, man, you, you proved once again, you're still, you're still a top, top fighter and you just, you, you have been for years, man. Honestly, honestly, one of the coolest people I ever speak to. But coming down to the last couple of questions, Thank Manita, you. man. Um, <laughs> Thank what, you. What, what do you want to do next, and at what weight do you think you'll be campaigning at? Well, you know, I'm gonna take Richard's advice and and see where I can go. I mean, 118 is never a problem for me. You know, um, we have we have a, a way. I'm, I'm tall enough for 126 as well, so we have we have. We have whatever it is that gives us the opportunities for a bigger fight, you know, and as well as 18, I'm still going to campaign to be the undisputed champion of the world. I mean, this is why I'm so motivated. This is why I'm so fighting because that's something that I, I have not obtained in boxing. I will obtain it one way or another. And this question came in uh, on Twitter from a regular listener um, at Ricey underscore SUFC. Basically said, um, are you going to be staying at bantamweight or perhaps going back up towards featherweight? Um, you kind of answered that there. And he also adds on, who would win in a singing contest, you or Carl Frampton? <laughs> no, Carl's not going to challenge me. That's just it. Carl's not going to challenge me. He knows it. I'm going to take him to Vegas. I'm going to watch his fight. I'm going to take him to a karaoke and then we'll probably perhaps put it on video. And and, and I'm going to make Carl submit that I'm the better singer. <laughs> <laughs> and just finally, Nanito, man, obviously you've got a, a whole heap of supporters here in the UK. What is your, your closing message just before the interview ends to your supporters that will be listening to this interview from over here that are behind yourself? Well, I just want to thank all of you guys out there, you know, um, for for all the support. I'm glad that you guys enjoyed the fight, you know. And sometimes when you look at fights like that, it gives us an understanding that well, life sometimes is is a difficult thing, you know. But when you when you give everything that you got, you know, there is really nothing left for you to to uh, to wonder if you had or if you did anything. There's no coulda, shoulda, woulda, and I think that life should be taken that way and and, and and it means to give it all you got you know in that fight that's what exactly what I did but hopefully that you saw the soul of, of, of me inside that that ring giving it all and, and I hope that you all you can do for yourself is to give it all whatever you guys are doing but again I appreciate each and every one of you guys and boxing is alive and it always will be but because of you guys. So I am truly grateful for your support and, and loving boxing with you. Thank you. Nanito, as you know, my friend, we love you on this show. Thank you so much for your time once again. Congrats on an epic performance, and I wish you the absolute best for the future. We'll, we'll for sure speak again real soon. Yes, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. You have a wonderful one. Okay, and this wraps up episode 214 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. The former heavyweight world title challenger, Eddie Chambers, has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our two guests on this week's show, the undefeated super lightweight prospect, Keith Hunter, and of course, the the livid legend, the future Hall of Famer, the former four-weight world champion, Mr. Nonito Donaire. A massive thank you to all of you guys 
as always, for listening to this week's podcast and all the rest. Remember to tell a friend to tell a friend. Uh, the Prediction League is back this week. Ayers has sent me his predictions. He backs Smith to beat Ryder by KO. He backs Wilder to KO Ortiz, and he backs Neary to beat Rodriguez on points. So his picks are exactly the same as you, the listeners' picks. But that is about everything. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again, hopefully, next week.